Mental Toughness, prepared for and presented at the 2016 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. Mental toughness is something that I speak to younger people who are outside entrepreneurship. Uh, so in that sense, I'm used to getting very clear instructions and trying to apply it. In this sense, this is more of an emotional connection. I hope that something that I share in my two stories will give you some type of inspiration to understand that entrepreneurship in its rarest, rawest form is a mental toughness play. Um, so with that said, I'm going to try to do my best to embody the coolness of Christy and, and the thoroughness of Mark and then the absence of Amy. <laughs> and, and hopefully, since she thought being the middle person was the worst, I will let you know being the last person on a Monday when it's raining outside is by far the worst placement. But I'm going to do my best to create the most value for you all. So with that said, we're talking about mental toughness. So first and foremost, why would I even talk about mental? You guys like that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, your, your, your brain on drugs or your, you know, <laughs> steroids. Yeah. So why even discuss mental toughness? Like why, why even sit down and have this discussion about mental toughness? We're all adults. We all have gone through things in life. You know, why are we discussing this? Somebody, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask. Yes, ma'am. Being an entrepreneur is all about mental toughness. If you don't have perseverance, you're not here. I mean, no one, you don't have a boss saying, hey, what's up with that deadline? It's all you to make it happen or not. Absolutely. Someone else. Yes. Like, uh, when we talk about risk and making decisions, incomplete information, and I believe you're making bad decisions, to the best ability, and it's up to you to adjust, pivot, et cetera. And even from that perspective, you raised your hand saying that you're a very technical person. And this is almost contrary to that because we can calculate and figure out almost everything in the equation, but we still can't figure out if it's going to work. We don't, we can't, we can't, as many analytics as we analyze, we still couldn't figure out if everybody in here is going to buy it, even when we know it's in their best interest. And mentally, some people can't deal with that. It's like, I did everything right and they still don't like me, you know? They still don't like me. What else can I do? And so when we start talking about mental toughness, it is truly your ability to be able to prepare for all of these things, all of these things that you'll encounter. So in, in, in my small world, I like to give definitions, but I think this definition can be applied in many ways. It can be defined in many ways. And of course, you all are welcome to have your own definition. But I look at it as your ability to control your mind under the most strenuous circumstances, the most strenuous conditions. Like the young lady said, it, entrepreneur is by far the most riskiest lifestyle that you will choose. You will lose friends. You will lose family. You will, you will have conversations that you are clearly right on. And everybody else is like, you are clearly wrong. And you still have to have the, I can't use that around you all, you still have to have the strength, um, I would say the testicular fortitude, <laughs> to be able to make that decision, own it, and go with it. And so, you know, we can joke about things here, but it, it, really, it, it, really, uh, it really creates a situation where it's you against the world in some cases. And you still have to balance um, reasonability, logic, you still have to balance understanding. But with all of that said, you still have to make the determination if this is going to work for you. So this whole mental toughness thing is, um, is something I've, bal I've battled my whole life uh, for whatever reason. So um, I like to say things like, it's you against you. You hear all these slow catch phrases, and that's really what it is. It's, it's a battlefield in your mind. And um, a lot of times people don't get that. Some people get it, some people don't. And the great part about life is at some point, if you live long enough, there's going to be something that you'll have to battle yourself on and everybody else, and it may not make sense, and you'll have to do it. And I look at entrepreneurship as one of those things. Some, something is 
planted a seed in you to become an entrepreneur, some, some silly thing that's dropped in you and you, I wanna start a company and I'm gonna put these things together in order to be successful. And, and that's it. And you have to be a mentally tough person in order to, um, in order to do that. Anybody know this guy? Yeah, yeah so I'm 42 and those are some old pictures. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Those are some old pictures. So I'm going to give you a couple stories about what I consider um, challenges for me um, to be mentally tough. And the mental toughness, I didn't realize was happening at that point, but I see the value in the results now and, and the determination to persist this. And so I recall, anybody in here play sports? Raise your hand. This, we're gonna, well, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand from time to time. I won't be up here very long. Um, and so I played football growing up. I played football. I played baseball. And as we know about, you know, different issues going on with concussions and things that football may not be the best sport for everybody to play. And if I black out while I'm up here, understand <laughs> that might be a reason why. I'm joking, but it's kind of not, <laughs> not funny. But um, so as a, as a kid, I started school a year early. So everybody around me was always a year to two, or two years early. I'm sure there are people like this, not, nothing unique, um, completely unique about that. But when I got to high school, I was 12 years old. And so everybody else was 13, 14, friends who were 15 years old, they were freshmen in high school, and I was 12. And so I played football because I grew up around people who say, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of anything or anybody. And so I recall like circumstances where there was a guy on the team. He was a junior when I was a freshman. And, and we're talking about summer football. So you get there early. I turned 13 probably two weeks after um, practice started. But I remember a guy there. To me, he seemed so much bigger than me. And funny, I saw the guy a few weeks ago. And great guy. But he seemed so much bigger. And he seemed so much stronger. And he has such a reputation there that, um, that you naturally kind of, you, you almost were intimidated. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's like this, this whole power thing. And so when I remember our head coach setting up all these different drills, and if you've played sports, you know, there are drills that you can't avoid certain people. And this particular drill, and I'm sorry if I'm, I, I bore you with the football talk, but this is part of the example. So the, the reality of it is they set up drills where you can't avoid going head to head. And when we talk about football, football is a brutal sport. It is size and strength dominates. And I remember in every drill growing up, not really being afraid of people, but now I'm the youngest, I'm small, I'm still small. And this guy was huge. And everybody knew he was like one of the best defensive backs. I mean, one of the best linebackers on the team, really in that particular, um, that league. And they set up a drill, and so I, I had this, I had this up here, so you got the X's and O's, we forget about that, this is my football reference. But this was actually similar to the drill, I found this online. And so, this is not exactly how it's set up, but follow me, so these would be cones, and these would be dummies. And so what would happen is, you would scrape here, so I was a running back, but it didn't matter who it was. I was a running back. He'd tell you to go, you'd run here, and either you pick this hole, this hole, this hole, or you pick this. This is the linebacker. He would feel. So you guys see how hard these guys hit. I was a freshman. I was probably about 165. This guy was easily about 240. And I had to think about all the stuff that I grew up with. Don't be afraid of anything. Stand up for yourself make sure that you're mentally tough, make sure that, that you prepare yourself the best way you can. So I, I try my best to assess the situation. Of course, when I was a freshman in high school, I wasn't saying I'm assessing the situation, but technically I was. I was thinking, okay, I'm faster, but I'm smaller. I got lower body strength and I can get lower. But when it's all said and done, I had to make a decision either to participate or not participate. Regardless of whatever assessment I did, I had to be mentally tough enough to say with everything in place that I know, that I know I don't know, variables that I, I can't account for, 
I need to do the best I can. And so I remember one time out of many times, because other times he crushed me, but on this particular occasion, I scraped. And I got lower than the guy, and I scraped, scraped, and I hit him. And the guy woke up, I mean, he, he got up, and he was, his bell was rung. And to me, I know it sounds real savage now, but to me as a kid, I was like, I, I did it. Like, I actually not only went against my fears, but I, not, but I was able to actually kind of best him. I, 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 I rung his bell. I won this particular battle. And I'm telling that story because nothing gets more to mental toughness than pure fear. You know, you fear getting hurt. You fear what your peers think because those are things that you think about in business. You fear starting a business, leaving your job, and failing and starting over. You fear having to maybe sell your car because you have to pay uh, your house note or pay your rent. You fear that everybody's looking at you like, dummy, why did you leave that job when they were paying you X amount of dollars? So in the most <clears throat> basic, in the most rudimentary way, fear will stop you and paralyze you and in most circumstances, it's hard to overcome by yourself. You actually have had to be groomed that way. You have to have somebody that's pushing you and motivating. It has to be something else, but in the reality of it is, it has to be you. And so you have to find strengths and weaknesses within your own circumstance that make you do things that other people don't see as reasonable and wise. And you know why? Because and, I, and I'm, I'm a spiritual person, so if I offend you, I apologize, but because God put a vision in your heart and your mind, and other people won't see it. That's the reality of it, is that you can explain all day, you can explain, you can have the best pitch deck on earth, and somebody's going to say, well, yeah, I still don't think people will buy it. Or like a, like a pitch I had recently where I was, I was talking to a friend of mine that's an investor who was giving me advice. He said, you know, so you're saying you can only bring back like a million and a half from this investment of 75,000? I don't think people think that's enough return. People will tell you stuff like that. And it's the reality of it. But the point is, is that you still have to be able to get your papers together, have your dignity, and move on, whether it's a friend or not. So that mental toughness thing is a good thing. And you guys don't have handouts for me because I'm a horrible person. So. <laughs> Just so you know, I, meant to, I told Christy that, just so you all know. Um, but the reality of it is, is that, again, one story, one example of you having to do what you have to do, and you have to pull it out of you. Um, so that's just the summary of it. Um, assessing my strengths, assessing my weaknesses, uh, determining variables that were out of my control, and then I went for it. You know, and that's, you know, your kids, you know, stuff happens. Sometimes you're too dumb to know better. As an adult, maybe, maybe it's a more uh, strategic decision. So I'll give you a second story. Second story is I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was 27. I was working for a company. I was making about 62 grand a year. I owned some residential rental property on the side, so I was bringing in about 35, I was, you know, I was, it, was, it wasn't bad for a 27-year-old guy. And what I wanted to do was I always wanted to start my own company. Why? Because I, I grew up in a youth program and the, the, the founder of the program would always encourage us to say, if you want to hire who you want to hire, you want to create these jobs, then you have to start your own business. So that always set in the back of my mind. And even in college, you know, I, I was a college athlete and even in college, I started a store called The Black Market. I was selling illegal food in the dorm. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the truth. Uh, some people know that when I go speak and some people bring it up and I find it hilarious, but it, it wasn't like, it wasn't stolen food. There were care packages that people who loved me would send me. <laughs> and I would turn around and I would make a sign and that sign would go up about eight, 9 p.m., right when people didn't want to walk down to the store 
called Steagles. I, I went to school in Atlanta. I went to undergrad in Atlanta. Store called Steagles. They didn't want to walk down there, so they would come knock on the door, and they would call me KT. That was, you know, nickname. KT, uh, what do you have? Read the sign. <laughs> and so they said, "Oh, okay. Well, let me get, let me get a two liter of Sunny Delight. Okay, that'll, that'll, <laughs> he, he, that'll be four dollars." <laughs> be what? Ah. Uh, Four dollars, it's a convenience fee. Come on, man, I'm your buddy, okay, three dollars. And so, I mean, but so even then, I wasn't thinking of things as an entrepreneur um, full time, but in this instance, I was 27, and I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I, I thought that what I was doing at the time was I was working for an um, accounting firm, and they had a financial management system um, account, and I was responsible for the, my financial management system in the IT side of things. And so I said, you know what? I could do this. I could do this on my own. If I was going to do it, this is the time to do it. I'm 27, no wife, no kids. I can create a plan. Let's, let's see what we can do. And so that was the question I, I had for myself. And so I, I started to do some research, like everybody has done who, who's interested in this program. I started to research what type of business structure should I have? Um, all the standard stuff that they feed you, you know, uh, location, location, location. Um, all the stuff that really doesn't determine if you should be in business. I'm not saying they're not important things. What I'm saying that it, it wasn't the, what value do I add to the customer? Um, what's my customer's willingness to pay? Am I, am, I, am I creating a model that speaks to their fear or that it speaks to their joy or that it, that it speaks to their happiness? Or is it a government regulation? What is the model of my business that's going to allow me to create a business model that makes those customers absolutely need me? I wasn't learning that. I wasn't learning um, what else, what else, what else, uh, how an actual person is gained as a customer. Is that person a user or a payer? And if that person is a user or a payer, how does that transaction look? How do I get that person to spend money with me? I was not learning that. When I was doing research, I was learning, should I make this an LLC? Like Amy said earlier, did I hire a lawyer? No, I know how to read and write. Should I make this an LLC or S Corp? And that's what I was learning. So I did research in that space. And then I did a self-assessment and I said, if I started this company and everything went to crap, how would I feel? What were my thoughts? You know, if I, how many, so at the time, I, I was young, and at the time, I, I had two cars, and one was a sports car, and I, you know, I, was, I was fine with that, you know? And I had to think about if I lost these material things, if I lost this stuff in pursuit of creating a business, how would I feel about that? What would I care about what people thought? And I really, I really a lot of people don't care what people thought. I, I don't care what people think now, but then I really was concerned about what people thought. And so I said, what could I tear away from me? What's the, what's the smallest amount of money I could earn to take care of myself? I had to think about all these things because that's what you think about when you start talking about risking you know, everything for a business. Because the goal is, in your mind, I'm going to start a business and I'm going to get rich. And the reality is a lot of people start businesses and they fail because they're too focused on location, 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 which is a great thing, and not really focused on the business model. And so I went through all these things, and I'm, how much money could I sacrifice? Could I sacrifice friends? And so what was interesting was I had, I had, a, few, I had a few friends that were entrepreneurs, and I called them cheaters because they're entrepreneurs who had spouses. And so <laughs> <laughs> some people get it right away, some people it takes a second. Some people, takes, it takes a second. So the people know what I mean. It's, and that's not a, a real dig or a real knock. It's just the reality that he breathes a little better when you have a second income. <laughs> and although you may have to pander a bit, or you, may have to bear, you may have to do some things you don't want to do when you get home, so your spouse allows you to be an entrepreneur and try this idea. Um, yeah, so, so I have friends that were entrepreneurs, and, and most of them were married, but they were encouraging. Some, I mean, some gave great advice. Um, some told you, you know, exactly this is what you need to do. 
you know, banks aren't your friend, you're gonna have to get lending. I mean, you guys all know that's, I'm not, you know, grants and banks don't care about you, you're high risk. Um, you know, you find a business model that works, you create some revenue, and then people might talk to you. <clears throat> so I talked to them, and then I got some bad advice. You know, you get a lot of bad advice. Man, make the office look nice. You know, make the office look nice for what? No, because when people come in, they want to see this office. You know, if the office does not directly contribute to your bottom line, get rid of the office. Yeah, I, was, I, I had an office on low because our, our marquee is still up with the lights and everything. And, I think it was costing me a, a wasted four grand a month. You know, so you can waste a lot of money, but ultimately, again, you know, it's your decision. You know, you have to you have to have that 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 opportunity to look and make your own determination. So then I, I would talk to friends, and then the very last person I talked to when I was talking about being an entrepreneur was somebody I held in very high regard. And so normally, when I talk to this person. If I thought it was logical and it made sense and it was reasonable, she was usually in, in line with me. If I talked to her about it, she usually said, you know, that makes sense. And so that was my mother. Now my father died when I was a freshman in college, but my mother would give me tremendous feedback. And she was not an entrepreneur, no entrepreneur people in my family. She had a math degree from SLU and a graduate degree from Webster. And she knew nothing about entrepreneurship and even less a desire about taking on that type of risk. And she understood the risk component, but more importantly, she said, why would you walk away from a job that's paying you this? And I'm saying, you know, that's really, it's, it's not a lot of money in the long term. And then you have to keep things in perspective because you have to be respectful of people. And my mother made it very clear, it was funny, but she said, where I work now, and she had been working in secondary education, well, she had been working at the community college since 76. She said, the position that I have now has just started paying me that. The thing that you're saying is so little or so minimal or menial, which I wasn't really saying that, but that's kind of how she felt because that's how I positioned it, because that was my reason for wanting to create a bigger opportunity. She said, you know, a lot of people work hard for that amount of money, so don't mistake it. And so her support was one, kind of out of fear, kind of lack of experience. And so that kind of shocked me, you know? And like I shared with you guys, this would be more of a personal story than a technical story to apply, but hopefully you all are finding value to it. And so somebody that I loved and I cared about that I re revered and regarded very highly actually disagreed with me which happens all the time when you have business. If it's your spouse, if it's your parents, if it's your brother, if it's your best friend, somebody's telling you your idea sucks. And you have to look and say, nah, it doesn't. And you have to have the supporting facts to back it up and you have to believe it. And so this person I held in high regards was like, nah, it's a bad idea. And told a buddy of mine who's an entrepreneur, was like, I think it's a bad idea and I think you're helping them with the bad idea, because you're fueling it. And he called me, he's like, no, no, no. So anyway, long story short, and this is, this is a little side note, what was interesting about that is, same lady who um, didn't want me to do it, she has a key to my house. And yeah, yeah, that's, you know, parents have kind of stuff like that. <laughs> she has a key to my house, and so she would come by sometimes, and so one, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I don't know, I, I, I notice things, and so, I noticed that she had been by the house, but I didn't know it because I saw any evidence. I just saw something that had fallen in my driveway. And so I picked it up and there's a um, blacktop on the, the driveway. And so when I picked it up, it was black and I turned it over. It was her ID and her pass card from work. And so the same lady who had no concern, and like I said, this is a sad note, I mean, a side note, but who had no concern or interest about me starting a business wrote a prayer, and she wrote a prayer, because I, I, I'm not normally knows that. I usually go through people's stuff, but I had to figure out what it was. I was like, that note has my name on it. So I pulled it out, and it was a prayer she had written for the success of my business. So I'm saying that to say is because a lot of times, even when everybody you know starts to doubt you, you might start to doubt yourself. But understand, when people respect you, and they respect your grind, they respect your hustle, and they respect your knowledge, 
they'll support you, even if they think it's a bad idea, even if they try to discourage you. So I'm saying that to say you have to always be willing to support yourself. Always be willing to support yourself and always be willing to believe in yourself. And so I looked at those things and I really had to figure out after I looked through all those and talked to all those people, what's the perceived risk? I mean, I have this mentality that a job is security, but we all know jobs not security. Job is structured as security. You think they like you, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, the right board member can come in and tell you, you need to leave and we need to show better returns for our board, for our, our shareholders. And so I had to look at that. Am I really looking at a job as security or am I looking at it as a way to leverage internally as an entrepreneur? Or am I just willing to take on all the risk as an entrepreneur by starting my own venture? So those are the things I had to think about in my should I start, um, should I start a business? And so ultimately I made that leap of faith and that's what I refer to it as. I assessed and prepared physically and psychologically. I prepared financially. I understood the risks and rewards that I was looking at. And you know, I believed in me. So I founded Turn Group Technologies in 2002. That's my cheesy picture on the side. And I took down at the Muni. Um, and I started several other startups. Uh, one recently, well, not recently, in 2015, got an award from I-10. It was called iChurch, which has now been pivoted. As you all business owners know, you'll have some pivots. It's been pivoted into a, uh, a new volunteer management project that we're working on. So um, yeah, so that leap of faith was something that, um, that was very difficult for me, but was very powerful for me in understanding mental toughness. Because at that point, I didn't let anything shake me. You know, I was already kind of a, a tough person before then, but at that point, once I finally divorced myself from what people thought, and I really focused on trying to make business work, that's, that, made me, that made me much tougher. So with all that said, Christy asked me to come speak to you all. And some of you all are looking at me like, yeah, I got stories like that too, blah, blah, blah. So what gives you the authority to come talk to us? We don't know you. I've never <laughs> seen you on Channel 2. You know, we, you know who, who are you? you know? And so I'll say, I'll say, what gives me the authority to talk to you all is this. Simply that, because I get up every day and I go get it. Regardless of successes, regardless of failures, um, regardless of doors being slammed in my face, um, regardless of people that I know well that I can't even, you know, we can't, we can't do business together for whatever reason, you know, be it very clear understandings or not very clear, I get up every day and I go hunt. And you probably have all heard this before. And when I'm hunting, then I go catch the prey. And when I catch the prey, then I cook the prey. And when I cook the prey, then I eat the prey. All the time, I'm still hunting because it never stops for entrepreneurs. It never stops for entrepreneurs. It is a continuous cycle of you getting up every day shaking off whatever, had, whatever happened to you yesterday and getting out there and going to get it. Believing in your idea, not blindly, but with preparation. Making sure that you have your T's crossed and your eyes dotted, uh, your eyes dotted. Yeah, did I say that right, eyes dotted? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's late for me too. Um, but you gotta get up every day and you have to find ways to motivate yourself. And we talk about mental toughness. That is what we're ultimately talking about. We're ultimately talking about everything that you need to master the battlefield or the battle that's going on in your mind. All the doubts that pop up, all the days you wake up and say, you know what, I'm tired of this. All the times you projected revenue that was, man, I thought this, I, I really thought this was gonna work. I gotta figure out another way to get customers to pay. All that, you got to get up every day, shake it off, and keep going. And this is not a rah-rah, you know, let's all go fight speech now. But it is. It, it is something that you have to find in you that you can motivate yourself every night, every day. Keep moving and do it. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your speech your presentation because it's very inspirational. I feel that at least for me, 
it, it is really what I needed, especially today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, yeah. uh, you know, finishing the course, I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. uh, there's a lot to do, and there's a lot where I can utilize all of this, but I think that your, um, your part has played a very inspirational piece within me because I've tried talking myself out of this, I don't even, I, countless times. How does, that, how, does, how does that conversation sound? You know what, I could just go get a job. <laughs> I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> With my job, so I can have enough time, obviously I can't, I'm, you know, I would be, you know, the street for a while. It's not good. Um, and so, it, you know, thank you, because it, it really is, some, sometimes I try to say, you know, it's my, it's my accent, or it's the color of my skin, or is that, you know, my hair like this, or is it, you know, I can't sell, or, you know, what is it? And then you, you try talking yourself out of it, but you know that you're doing the right thing, and that you do have to just go get it. Yeah, I mean, that's the reality of it. That, I mean, let, let's make no mistakes about it. They, there are going to be filters and buffers and issues with anybody starting a business, for whatever reason. And that's the honest truth. But it's not easy. I mean, like, it, it really is not easy. It's not, I'm, I'm scaring you. I'm like, you guys are adults. I might scare you all. But the reality of it is you have to get up. And, you, and when it's all said and done, if you've done everything that you can, and everybody tells you no, doesn't mean you're a failure. But it means you can go back and reassess what's going on. Because I'm a firm believer. I don't care if it's business relationships, personal relationships, if things don't go well, I look at the whole situation, but I always reassess me because I'm the common denominator in everything. So yeah, it could be anything, but still look at how you can improve and how you can do better, but it's your motor. <laughs> you gotta find things that inspire you and make you go. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so speaking of mental toughness and obstacles and all these things that you know, people face along the way, you know, even having your mother, who I'm sure is probably like the biggest you know, person in your life is like, oh, that's Sure. What was the validation point for you? Because clearly you've gone ahead and you you said you established Turn Group and other entrepreneurial ventures. What was it that made you on this journey say, okay, I'm I'm on the right track. I'm gonna keep going with this. Because you all, everyone needs that that point to say, okay, something to help you keep going. So you want to know the truth, or you want to know the thing that's going to inspire you? No, I want to know the truth. <laughs> So the truth is, is that I've start, I have children's books that I've written. I just got back from New York, and a literary agent was there talking to me about stuff. So I, I've done some things that I am not satisfied with, but I'm thankful for. And so to answer your question, I haven't felt, like I don't feel that. Like I feel like there's so much more that I need to do, and I feel like my measure of success, I'm still not close to. I've been... I've been a recipient of uh, the City of St. Louis Business of the Year. I've gotten tons of awards for um, small business entrepreneurship. I've gotten awards from the St. Louis American. I've gotten awards from the Regional Business Council. But I can't eat awards. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, I, I stole that because that's really from a rap song of one of my favorite groups. But, but I mean that. Like, I, I mean that. You can't eat that. And so if that's not a measure of success for you, then it, it, so it, doesn't, it doesn't work for me. I'm so thankful. I'm so appreciative. And when I look at business, I look at, man, I haven't reached this plateau. Like, like we've had peaks. I've pivoted Turn Group. You know, what Turn Group does now is we start off as an IT infrastructure firm. And we have financial management system clients. We had clients from Syracuse, New York, to Milwaukee. And as we realized, margins were shrinking because, um, just because technology was advancing and there are more people doing the same thing, we had to keep pivoting. And so what we do now is, we design mobile apps, we design websites, but in that space, we talk to people and we say, well, how are you measuring the success of your spending? And what data are you using? And so we start to say, okay, well, let us help you gather data, not only from third-party analytics, but data directly from your customers and customers that look like you. So when you make this marketing spin that a lot of people look as a sunk cost, when you make that marketing spin, we try to create a correlation between how much you spend online digitally and some type of representation of metrics you can use to say, oh, this worked in this space or that space. That was a pivot. So every time I got a pivot, some people look at that as just surviving. I'm looking at that as like, 
I should have been ahead of that. Should have been ahead. Of, so when I look at my measure, I fell every day. So that's part of my inspiration. It's like, I don't care who passed me on the back. I got friends who think I walk on water. I had, they, they Google this stuff, and this stuff is so not true. They're like, oh, this says your revenue was this. It's like, my revenue wasn't. I'm telling you, it wasn't. Look, look, it's your turn to pay. If my revenue was that, I wouldn't even worry about whose turn to pay it was. <laughs> and so I, I so mean this when you have to figure out every day what your own personal measure is. Because for me, it's, you know, when will I have something that will get enough critical mass that people are using it and I have enough structure behind it that it actually looks like a company that I would want to have started if I had planned to start it that way? Because you all know when you plan to start a company, how it looks when you plan it and how it ends up, always different, never the same. I'm sorry, your hand. So um, I found both like in, if you're interviewing for a job or you're talking with a potential donor or investor or whatever the case may be, they often want you to substantiate your grit. Like, you know, give an example of when you failed and how you've overcome it. Like, yeah. That's like, like, that's like, a, that's like a, Love that nonsense can, question. Can, can line, right? Um, because I feel like as a, and the previous um, uh, presenter was talking a lot about like being authentic, et cetera. The more authentic you are about your failures, the more sort of lackadaisical you look as a manager, right? Like, because we're supposed to be able to see around every corner, et cetera. So when you're facing that situation, um, how do you navigate? How do you approach that conversation? Like, like telling them like, like, like a good enough failure? You know what I mean? Like, so, how, how do you talk about that? So, so you, you can go the old school, because it's such a BS question. So you, to me, you go the route of, it, it's, so tell me what was the worst example? You know, the worst example is, you know, I stayed up all night because I had to present on Monday. So I stayed up all night Sunday doing research and I just made sure that everything was in place. So when my presentation was kick ass, everybody, you know, cheering and the company was happy. Like, well, what's the failure? The failure was that I stayed up late. That was my personal time I sacrificed. Sounds like a BS answer, right? Well, it was a BS question. So I'm giving you a BS answer. So if you want me to tell you, what do you want me to tell you? When I tripped and fell and I got up? You know, I mean, what do you want me to tell you? So the reality of it is clearly you can't, you can't get an attitude, in the, but you can give, you know, you can give an answer that allows them to know that it's so BS that they probably don't want to answer it again. I was at the bread company maybe about two months ago and I was sitting next to a lady to interview two people in a row. Each time they asked that question, I kind of stopped doing what I was doing. And I was kind of eavesdropping. I was like, and they were so smooth. They were like, oh, there was a time where, you know, four people didn't show up. And I, I probably should have scheduled five people that day. And I was like, man, this person, she's really, and she was the first young lady who said she's about 20 years old. I was like, she's pretty good at the BS game. It is what it is. I, you know, I wish I had a better answer for that. But when people throw BS at me, I learned from Mark Bauer to throw BS back. <laughs> so any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I really Um, Happy birthday. <laughs> um, and so like, this is a really good um, spot uh, or, or, or um, topic to talk about for today, especially for me, because um, I do have like a lot of fears, um, but I'm also very interested in like a lot of different things. And so you talked about books. I want to write books. Don't do it. Don't. So this is what you do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Before you go any further, I'm not going to just, you, I'll let you finish. Yeah. Focus on one thing first. Okay, yeah. Laser beam focus on something. Get the business model right on what the, the example that I'm telling you is a horrible example. I am a, <laughs> I am a living embodiment of horrible example. You get an idea, you know it can be done. You do it. You get an idea, you know it can be done. You can't get investors. You fund it yourself. You do it. Don't do that. One idea at a time. I, I really strongly believe that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go no, ahead. No, that's kind of like what I was getting at. Because what, what I've been trying to do is just like make them all fit together. So it's like, oh, I'm a teacher, so like I can do this in this way. Well, that's a, that's, consider that. Bring it, but make it one business model. Don't make it individual companies doing things. So that's, I think that's an excellent idea if you can blend them and make it one business model that works for you. you know? But please don't do multiple things at once. It's possible. But it's just not reasonable. It's not, it's not a good direction to go in. And then the other side of it is you're 25, and 
I mean, I, I'll say this for 25 year olds and 40 year olds, and, and I, I heard the message from a 60 year old. You know, everybody around you, half of them won't understand. Like, the business, they think entrepreneurs, just money grows on trees, and then they just, you show up, oh, you don't go to work every day. Like, like you're at home doing nothing. This, this is the idea. The people that love you the most think that you're sitting around doing nothing all day long. Like, they think that is the life of an entrepreneur. It's like, oh, you don't work. You don't have a boss. I love this one. You don't have a boss. And I have to explain to them, every customer that I have, I'm responsible to. Every staff member, every contractor, anybody that I work with, I'm accountable to. Those essentially are your bosses. You can't have business without those people. So understand, the first people that you'll look to for support will not have any idea that won't have any idea. So that's one thing. And then if you're able to sustain a business, and I t this guy was talking to me, I want to say, had to be three years ago. He bought a company. He said, I tried to make friends there. He said, I, I made all the directors and the VPs. And we'd go to lunch. He said, but whatever it was, they knew I was an owner and I couldn't make friends because they wouldn't pull that barrier down because I had the ability to fire them. And so what I'm telling you all this for is that not because you have the ability to fire them, that's not on your side, but other people, other people don't see you as a contemporary anymore. Like if, if you hiring folks, like a buddy of mine, I hired a buddy of mine, I just lost him last year to Boeing. He got married, had a kid. I said, man, look, Boeing made you a great offer. I can't compete with Boeing. I'm a small company. Boeing is, is, is juggernaut. And so I said, um, I said, but even then, I, I rarely trust people. I trusted him. I told him, talk to the client. He was afraid that he would say something that would ruin the business. And I had more confidence in him than he had in himself because he knew it was a risk to my business. So he had respect for me and I had respect for him, but we couldn't make that worked because he only wanted to do this and he didn't want to do anything that was risky. And I'm saying that to say is that it's your risk. No matter, people always say you need somebody who thinks just like you and acts just like you to be your right hand man. And the reality of it is they thought just like you and they act just like you, they'd already start their own company. They'd be an entrepreneur too. So the reality of it is a lot of people won't relate to you. You're gonna lose some friends. It's a lonely place to be. I was dropping somebody off Last Wednesday, last, last Tuesday, he said, man, people don't understand. He just started a business. People don't understand the sacrifice. And I'm riding, I'm driving, I'm saying, yeah, you're right. People don't understand, but I understand. Because the reality of it is it's a lonely place when you're committed to the success of your business and there's no blueprint. I can make, I can, Coca-Cola and Pepsi taste just the same. I know they don't, so I don't wanna hear. No, they don't. But the reality of it is Pepsi couldn't take a Coke business model and make it work 100% of the time. Pepsi couldn't make a Coke business model work 100% of the time. And so there are no two things that are like in business. That's a frustration alone. Every step that you take in opening your doors in business is an example of your mental toughness. And it does not mean you're weak if you quit because, did I have that up there? It is not easy, but never quit. Or quit. <laughs> be smart enough. No, really, I'm like, be smart enough to know when you're done. You know what? I, I heard Keith. I heard what he said. You know, but but I'm not quitting. Somebody else could be like, I heard Keith. I know what he said. My wife said, if I don't turn a profit in the next six months, she's leaving me. I'm gonna quit. Make a decision. Make a decision. <laughs> Make a decision. But with that said, my goal here today was not necessarily to give you, again, the technical pieces that you can directly apply to your business plan or your strategy but really just help you understand that you're not the only one going through this. You won't be the first, you won't be the last. Spend a lot of your time on the business model, the business preparation. Get money in the door, execute the business model. Understand how you pull a string here, you pull a lever there, and this customer comes, they pay money. Get that together. The other stuff will come, it'll come. But focus on the business model and then just focus on Patience, meditation, prayer, whatever you need to fight the world. Because every day you're going to get up and somebody's going to have something to say. A bill will be due or a client will be upset. Anything. I mean, because everything you're fighting for just opens you up to more. You, oh, we landed this big customer and they call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, this thing is failing. I was trying to remote in. We were, I'm on vacation in Mexico and we can't remote in. We need you to send somebody. Man, we're so thin. Like, okay, normally sending somebody means me. I was like, 
So the reality of it is, is that it won't be easy, but it'll definitely be worth it. Definitely be worth it. So with that said, that is my mental toughness presentation. If you have any more questions, ask it now, because I know it's probably bedtime for most of you all. <laughs> <laughs>